how this program got started. Uh, we'll get started about uh, to talk about how this program got started, where we are, and um, you know challenges and things that we've kind of worked through along the way. Uh, and then also have plenty of time for some Q&A at the end to make sure that we uh, hear from everyone uh, here who'd like to share thoughts uh, and uh, give us some questions. So um, by way of starting, my name is Sean Chateau. I am the buyer at the Greater Chicago Food Depository. Um, we are um, the food bank for the city of Chicago. So basically what that means is that uh, the food depository is a central warehouse that provides food uh, to pantries and organizations around the city that are kind of doing the last mile or um, the direct handoff to people who are getting food through this system. The um, job that I have is buyer. Uh, so what I actually do on a day-to-day -day basis is a lot of uh, ordering food. Uh, it's a big operation. We serve around 75 million meals a year, which is kind of an amount that is hard to wrap your head around. But what that actually adds up to is just numerous trucks on the road every single day, uh, six days a week, and um, you know millions of pounds of food cycling through uh, the facility. So what, we, uh, what I do is uh, basically handle a lot of the paperwork, vendor relationships, making sure all the, the dollars and cents add up and um, building those relationships with our clients, uh, or sorry, with our, uh, with our vendors. Um, the food depository has a, an updated sort of uh, mission statement, which includes the idea that food is a human right. And that's something that really motivates me and animates me on a day-to-day -day basis. I'm really excited about what that means uh, as far as what our programs are. And um, yeah, I will obviously talk quite a bit about our, our hyper-local program in a moment, but I just kind of wanted to give you that basic overview of, uh, of the food depository. Um, and then as, as for me myself, I mean, I've been here for about one year, so I am new. Uh, a lot of people maybe have like a long, deep history with the food depository, which has been in operation since the late 70s. Uh, so my level of knowledge is based on what I've been able to see in the last year or so. Uh, so I have limited, you know, insight to all of that stuff. And I just wanted to set the expectation that I might not have, have all the answers, but I know, hopefully I know some of the people who do. And um, I think that is the basic stuff I wanted to go over for myself. Uh, Mick, why don't you tell the folks who you are and what you do? I think that you have to get unmuted by the host. Hey there. Can you hear me all right there, Sean? Great. My name is Mick O'Donnell. I am the food procurement coordinator here. So I am in the same um, group with Sean here, but I deal with more of the donation side of things. So I am constantly fielding calls and emails and reaching out to prospective donors to try and acquire food that might, you know, not have made it to its intended route or um, might be nearing its expiration date and something that we want to still be able to move to uh, communities in need. I began here a little over a year ago um, and I actually came from Feeding America Eastern Wisconsin in uh, Milwaukee, Wisconsin. So I've worked in food banking my entire professional life um, and is actually where in Wisconsin is where I began my interest in hydroponics, which I will be talking on um, a little bit uh, a little bit later here today. Um, but yeah, I'm very excited to talk. Thank you, Sean, for kicking us off, and I uh, will move it over to Ezra. Thanks, Mick. Um, hi, everybody. I'm Ezra Lee. I'm the uh, farm program manager at Growing Home. Um, we're an urban farm and job training um, program uh, down in Englewood. Uh, we're about we're at about an acre and a half, an acre and three quarters in size right now. Um, we've been operating in Englewood since 2006. Um, I've been here since 2021. So I've been here for about two years now um, and been working with Greater Chicago Food Depository pretty much since I very first started was when our, our program got going. Um, I, yeah, I'm 
I've been a grower since 2017 as well, um, working mostly out um, in the uh, eastern U.S. Um, in Massachusetts, western Massachusetts, and upstate New York, um, where I was growing kind of in a rural setting, and then moved to Chicago for the opportunity to work um, on an urban farm and work uh, in kind of more of an educational setting. Um, so it's been really exciting to work in, a, I think, a more complicated food system um, and work in a food system that uh, has a lot more channels and opportunities to get food directly into the hands of that that need it and from kind of these hyper local locations um, kind of incorporating a different built in community sort of cost. Um, so yeah, that's my my basic history get get more into it in a bit. That's great. Um, and I realized I didn't tell anything about my history. Uh, so yeah, I've been at the food depository for a year, but prior to that, I was working at local foods distributors as a buyer for a, a bit over five years. And uh, I also spent six years on the board of the Dill Pickle Food Co-op uh, during the time that the food co-op went through their expansion. Uh, that was a very exciting time. And that's where I learned how to do uh, consensus decision making, which has been deeply influential to my uh, how I operate uh, in the world. Uh, also worked at a CSA farm prior to that, and I've just been uh, kind of around. Um, so I yeah, wanted to make sure to share that. So uh, the next section that I want to go through is to talk a little bit about the background of food production in Chicago and on the land that is uh, now known as Chicago, uh, as well as kind of digging back into the, the history of how this program came together. Um, so the, oh, uh, first, I want to make sure to talk about the people who are not on this panel. Uh, of which there are many, many who are instrumental in making what we do happen and make a lot of stuff that we're not even interacting with happening. Um, so I want to give a shout out to Alicia Garand, who is uh, handling the, um, the the part of this operation that involves talking to our pantry partners. Um, that's crucial work. Um, I want to thank uh, Sylvester Arambula and Michael McFall on my team uh, for encouraging us to bring this forward. Um, I want to thank everyone that works at the pantries that we work with, the ones that we will work with, and the ones that we haven't even started to talk to about this stuff yet. The people that run the food pantries at uh, the, the food depository delivers food to are uh, what keep the city running in a lot of ways. Uh, so that's a, that's a crucial set of people that I want really uh, have a lot of appreciation for. Um, quick shout out to uh, the people at the farms that we are working with. Uh, so Gary Comer Youth Center is one of them, uh, Michelle Lacey, who uh, oversees uh, programs there, and then uh, Sandra Reno, who's our uh, main contact there. Uh, much appreciation to them. Uh, Stephanie Dunn from Star Farm, uh, Keelan Blackwell from Southside Blooms, and uh, the dozens of hands and people that uh, do all of the actual physical labor that brings all that food uh, to fruition. And... Um, the really important uh, set of people that are not on this panel that I want to thank are the people who are attending, who have been doing this work way longer than I have, way longer than any of us have, uh, or that you know have, have built your own networks and your own systems. Um, I want to set the expectation that this is a uh, this this panel discussion is to talk about this small thing that we've done, and we recognize that we're operating in a city and in a, and a region that is full of amazing impactful, powerful work uh, that is happening. And um, I just wanna thank everyone uh, that's on this call and who couldn't make it to this call, who's been part of building that system, that infrastructure, because that is um, that is the water we're swimming in. And so, like I said, we're gonna talk about this little program that we've been able to put together in the context of what we do. And there's just a lot more uh, that can be done there. So uh, looking forward to connecting, hopefully with some folks uh, after this call to talk about um, working together in the future. Um, so, okay, um, moving into talking a little bit about history here. So the land that Chicago sits on uh, has a long history of uh, food production. This, this soil is fertile, and I think there's a lot of uh, amazing uh, history that we, uh, that is, that is not, um, that is that is carried by people. Um, so to talk a little bit about uh, indigenous growers who cultivated grains uh, extensively on this land before it was uh, settled by European uh, settlers. Um, the uh, the Council of the Three Fires uh, operate like 
existed here and uh, grew uh, grains extensively. Chicago itself was actually a location of uh, a lot of a lot of trade and a lot of movement. Uh, my understanding is that around uh, the corner of 31st and Kedzie is a place where there was a portage between uh, kind of the watersheds of the Mississippi River uh, and the uh, tributary rivers and uh, the um, and the Lake Michigan uh, water system. So uh, food has been moving across this land uh, for many hundreds of years, uh, if not thousands of years. And I think that's a uh, really important background to have. Also the fact that the, the fact that, that was, this area was seen as very fertile and very um, prone to being um, cultivated uh, is part of why um, settlements started here. Uh, and for uh, the people that uh, built out the extensive farmland in the surrounding area, uh, they know that the soil here is fertile. Um, the other people that know that the soil here is fertile is the people on this call who grow food right here. Uh, and they know that this is a great place to grow food. Um, then to talk about a little bit about the uh, 18, throughout the 1800s as the city of Chicago and the settlements uh, were growing here, the, uh, there are a couple of like really notable pieces of history here. One of them is that there was extensive celery uh, growing happening along uh, along Lake Michigan, um, all you know, all throughout the throughout the north side of the city. Uh, so, what is now Lakeview used to have quite a few uh, celery fields growing there, um, and the uh, companies that started growing uh, cucumbers for pickles also uh, were all over the place. Uh, that's part of why. So, the history is that the reason that we've got uh, celery salt and pickles on the Chicago dog is because those were homegrown products that people here were uh, super excited to uh, promote and uh, and be Windy City about. Um, so that's that's a little bit of um, the the food growing history. There also used to be an extensive uh, greenhouse infrastructure. So there were indoor grown crops. Flowers were actually a huge commodity that would come out of Chicago. Uh, throughout the 1800s and early 1900s. And a lot of that uh, got moved aside for development, for residential development, real estate, those sorts of things. So I think that the uh, that background knowledge of food has grown here for uh, decades, centuries, like this is, this is a place for food. So I think that that's a really important thing to couch ourselves in. Um, I don't have a deep and full history of all of the hyper-local food uh, production that's happened in the last 10 or 15 years. I think there are people here on this call who have that knowledge and that background um, who are, are sharing it in all kinds of other contexts. So I'm going to leave it to those experts to talk about all that amazing work that's happening. Um, but I'll jump right into what we're doing and what we're talking about here. Uh, so the uh, the overview of like how we got started in uh, looking at this stuff. I think that there's probably a lot of research and a lot of like socio sociological background understanding that went into um, getting the, food, the, the you know, upper management and the, the senior leadership team at the food depository to recognize that, you know, urban agriculture and hyperlocal food sourcing is really crucial. Uh, I'm not that expert. I just know how to make the stuff work. So this is kind of more of a nuts and bolts kind of conversation. Um, the uh, program got started, uh, the conversations around the program really got started in 2020, uh, when uh, a predecessor, someone who's left the uh, food depository, Brendan Kitt, who may or may not be here, he's around, um, he, uh, he and a few other people at the food depository um, started trying to figure out how to use the resources of the Greater Chicago Food Depository to uh, provide some sort of support, some sort of benefit to the growers that are here in our city. And uh, the program that they landed on that very soft launched, I think, in 2020, and then got going more in earnest in 2021, and then uh, expanded a lot in this last growing season. Um, that's that's kind of where that came from. So what that um, what that looks like right now um, is the uh, where are we? <laughs> I'm looking at my notes. Um, so the uh, basically, we are um, getting started with, we're getting started. I think that's what I want to say. And I think I've already said that. I'm going to keep saying it. 
this is a kind of initializing conversation uh, to start building these networks to um, see how we can connect uh, the food depository with uh, and the, the resources of the food depository to help uh, connect farmers to their neighborhood. So um, the other important thing that I want to highlight is that we are uh, we are not responsible for building the, the the framework and the infrastructure that has led to this uh, really great uh, you know initializing program. There are so many people, like I said, on this call who have built that uh, built that background. Um, so yeah, um, Mick or Ezra, did you have anything else that either of you would like to add to the sort of like history part, and then we'll kind of jump into talking about exactly how this program's working right now? No, particularly, yeah, just that it started definitely through in, in 2020, I believe, um, working through to look for kind of places to um, connect our local food system into kind of the existing structure of food distribution um, that Greater Chicago Food Depository already had developed. And, you know, some of the really important pieces that we were looking for were, um, you know, distributing into locations that were food insecure already and distributing really, really fresh food. Um, you know, the idea of it being hyperlocal is that it's um, the freshest food possible. And so we're looking for pantries that accept, you know, would be willing to accept and coordinate those deliveries on the day that they're having their pantry or who have additional cooler space already. Um, so it was really important to make sure that we kind of had those paths set up. And, and I knew that took quite a bit of time and effort in order to make sure that, um, yeah, that, that kind of all of the logistics sorted out between um, various local partners were, were ready to work in, in motion. Cool. Um, so we'll uh, move kind of like nice and slow through this next section here, um, talking a bit about exactly what, uh, what we built here. And uh, I will start by saying basically, it's a simple program. It's not complex. Uh, the There are complexities kind of in the background, uh, but the actual day-to-day -day operations, I think we've got something relatively simple going on here. So in super short, what happens is the food depository has a, uh, has a, a budget that we can spend on this program and, and purchase food from these uh, farms that are here in the city. And the basic setup is the farm, uh, it gets connected to a pantry that is part of the food depositories network uh, that's right in the same neighborhood. And then um, we uh, just kind of on a weekly cycle have the people at the farm grow the food, write down what the food is, provide an invoice, and then bring it over to the, uh, the food pantry um, where they, they sign off on it. And then we get, um, the, the people at the food depository get the uh, the paperwork back and then we process that for payment uh, just like any vendor. And I think that there's a lot that goes into all of that, which is what we're gonna talk about here. But the basic structure of it is very simple. It's just um, providing funds to pay food for food at an accurate cost. Uh, I think that one of the big things that we're trying to achieve with this, one of the, one of the big goals is acknowledging the real cost of food and making sure that there's not a uh, the that and, and finding a way to um, eliminate the sort of exploitation that happens in, in more of the commercial food system and what that means is paying way more per pound um, but also recognizing that as a true investment in the community and in in our neighborhoods um, the another huge benefit is the thing that you'll hear I think a lot of other people with deeper knowledge on this stuff talked about at this conference, which is connecting people to their food, um, having a situation where people can see what the, the food, where the food is growing, learn more about what kinds of food uh, grow here, and also partake in the, participate in the sort of back and forth conversation of, you know, what, what people actually want to eat uh, that is being grown at these farms. Um, so to date, uh, we can say in the last, since uh, July 1st of 2022, uh, we spent uh, a little over $60,000 um, on uh, food from this program. Um, that is a little part of the budget of the food depository, obviously, um, but we are uh, excited to see that growing. Um, I think more than, um, 
it's more than six fold over the last year, um, six or seven fold. Um, so that's really good. Uh, we've got we've moved fifteen thousand pounds of food through this system, um, and that is again a very small fraction of uh, what is being done by the food depository. Um, but it is uh, I think that the way that I thought of it is that each dollar and each pound uh, that of food that's moving through this system is making a bigger and broader impact than the uh, the sort of like larger commodity purchases, USDA purchases or USDA uh, food that we get. Um, that helps feed people um, with uh, with the nutrients that they need. And I think there's, you know, obviously a lot of community that's built there, but um, having that connection directly to the farm is something that's huge, um, hugely important. Um, Ezra, I think I wanted to ask you, do you have other ways that you think about what the sort of like goals and benefits of what this program is um, and benefits you've seen, goals that you have for the near future? Yeah, I think, you know, one of the major benefits is um, for, for small farms or for growing farms is providing a certain level of stability um, is certainly something to talk about. Um, you know, we, we had previously been kind of built quite a bit for market sales and we are still doing lots of market sales, market and CSA sales, but moving into wholesale is really, you know, extremely helpful to provide kind of a, a stable and consistent um, source of certainly income, but also a source of distribution. Um, when you bring stuff to market, there's never necessarily assurance that everything that you bring is going to get sold or all of the items that you are kind of working to grow in your in your capacity are going to be desired or wanted. Um, and it's great as an outreach tool, but markets are not necessarily always the most efficient way to kind of grow um, or make sure you're utilizing kind of this precious space that we have in the city um, that we use as growing space. So it's been a great boost to be able to, um, you know, be able to move into wholesale and move into wholesale for planning. Um, for myself, I do quite a bit of the crop planning um, for our, our site. And so, you know, we, we get to talk really early on about um, what partners are looking for, what the pantry is looking for. Um, we've been able to, you know, I, I get firsthand feedback um, when I go and make deliveries about what, what people want, what people want to see more of. And it can really contribute directly into not just next week's plan, but what we see as kind of general growth and, and guiding through our programming as well about what people may want to see. Um, so it lets me build in really early on. Uh, you know, I, I can decide if I, I need to grow extra an extra field's worth of collard greens, or if you know something didn't didn't sell very well, or the pantry decided that they wanted to see more variety. I think that's something we encountered a lot this year. Was we were expecting kind of more narrow interests, and we've we've actually seen kind of a wider variety wanted through the wholesale program, which is great. Um, so yeah, that really early planning is excellent, and that that feedback um, kind of drawing us that feedback is rare to get from wholesale. It's something you usually get from market sales, um, but the stability and the feedback is, is so, so important and really great to see. That's great. Um, yeah, so uh, to talk a little bit more about how these programs get set up and how, we, um, how we're hoping to expand this uh, to more farms in the next, uh, throughout this next growing season, um, it's, it's a, Again, I, I, I think of things and like I try to simplify them as much as possible, both for myself and for keeping a, a system that uh, can maybe be expanded. Um, so the way that we get uh, that we talk to farms is pretty straightforward. Um, first of all, we want to make sure that you are able to uh, handle some volume on a weekly basis. Um, we want to um, be purchasing a few a couple hundred dollars worth of produce at a time that helps cover um, the sort of administrative background work that has to happen to make this stuff um, come together uh, as far as like accounting for accounting purposes. But the um, but the idea is to have it be the case that even a, a you know pretty modest sized uh, farm here in the city can uh, take part in this program. Uh, the other um, element is pricing. I mean, this is a, a real thing. Like I'm not, uh, we don't do pricing comparisons to, you know, commodity onions from uh, the, uh, from farms in big farm, you know, big multi-acre farms in Wisconsin or something. 
we're looking at you know reasonable kind of farmers market approximate prices and trying to kind of settle on what makes sense. And uh, we lock that in at the beginning of the year so that there's um, not really going to be a lot of fluctuation and um, just go forward from there. So once and so once we have the uh, sort of background conversation lined up, it's there's a little bit of paperwork that goes into it. We want to see um, I think food safety is definitely always a concern and we want to be able to see what the um, food safety plan is for handling crops, uh, handling and packing crops. Um, the, as of now, I think that we are uh, talking, I think most of the farms that we've talked to are working on GAP certification. I know growing home is uh, probably just up to your ears in that. <laughs> um, but um, yeah, we, we want to make sure that there are uh, food safety plans in place and we can, you know, talk with you kind of one-on-one -on -one about what the best format that should take is. And then um, sort of like on a, a a week to week, day to day basis. Um, we like to know what's coming up, what's going to be growing. Uh, so a lot of times we'll get an email maybe on a Monday. Um, and then um, right now, I think everybody's that's doing this program is uh, delivering to the, their pantries on Wednesdays. It doesn't have to be exactly that. Um, but the um, the the consistency is definitely key. So you, you want to be able to provide either freshly picked and, uh, and directly delivered or, or properly chilled um, food uh, to people uh, when you drop it off. Um, I actually see the note, <laughs> I see the note in the chat about, um, you know, how can a pantry participate and what that is, um, what that looks like is basically connecting with our team uh, about the, um, uh, make, making sure that you're uh, set up as a Greater Chicago Food Depository Pantry and then um, connecting with my colleague Alicia. The idea is to have farms and, and the pantries that are receiving the food in the exact same place, uh, like in, in the same in the same neighborhood. Um, I think that's extremely doable and I think there are, are a lot of amazing farms and a lot of amazing pantries uh, throughout the city. Um, we do have a big focus on the south and west sides of the city and um, would like to talk to whoever's uh, growing food in those areas or other areas, you know, talk to us about that as well. Um, that's the background stuff. I think there's um, maybe more details that we could get into about the uh, the processes that we have, maybe a little more back and forth. Uh, but I do want to bring Nick in to talk about the hydroponic program, which is super cool. Uh, so, Nick, go ahead. Thanks, Sean. That was great. I learned a lot right there. I appreciate all that. So yeah, I am here to talk a little bit about the Food Depository's um, prospective hydroponics pilot program here. Um, the idea kicked off uh, about a year ago um, because I had taken my interest in hydroponics from my previous employment at the uh, Feeding America Eastern Wisconsin, where I worked with hydroponics there. And I wanted to continue that here at the Food Depository. So about a year ago, I had pitched an idea of some form of hydroponics. Now we find ourselves a year later putting together a pilot program here. Um, and for those who don't know, hydroponics is the idea of growing food, be it lettuce, be it tomatoes, strawberries, in a closed setting, in a closed variable system. So what it does is it takes out externalities such as soil health, um, nutrient availability, climate, you know, uh, availability of sunlight, and it puts it in a closed system where all those variables are con controlled. And what that does is allows you to grow year round in a, a very specific way. And it allows you to optimize growth. If, if something's not growing well, rather than having to wait a full growth cycle, which could be anywhere between, you know, 45 days to two months to an entire summer, it allows for quicker turnover and um, quicker pacing in correcting mistakes that might have come up along the way. Um, now, it's not to say that hydroponics is a, a paradigm shift in um, agriculture. Hydroponics has been around for quite some time, but the technology and the interest has really accelerated itself in the last 10 to 15 years, largely in part to um, the legal cannabis industry 
uh, where you have to grow in a closed environment. So a lot more interest and funding has gone into the industry just based on that, which has really improved the overall um, you know, quality of the plants put out and the systems that are produced. So here at the food depository, we have a two phase pilot program that we kicked off uh, just a few months ago. Um, this coming March, we will be um, procuring and getting into our actual warehouse here, two large hydroponic systems that can grow upwards of 3000 heads of lettuce every 45 day cycle. That's not to say we'll be growing, you know, 3000 heads, but it has the ability to produce that and you can stagger that over a period of time to supply lettuce when it is needed. The um, overarching goal of this program is to provide fresh leafy greens, um, lettuces, kales, really anything you can think of, parsley, sage, et cetera, to our kitchen here for, to be used as ingredients in a future meal prep uh, facility. So come this March, we will have two indoor units um, from a vendor called Fork Farms out of uh, Green Bay, Wisconsin, actually. Uh, we're bringing those here and operating those in our warehouse. Looking forward to the end of the summer, we will be procuring a large uh, storage container unit. So the storage containers units you see on trains or the back of trucks or ships, they take those and actually retrofit them. So they up upcycle them with the necessary uh, infrastructure to grow hydroponics inside. One of these systems can grow anywhere between 5,000 to 9,000 heads of lettuce in that same 45 day cycle. So just in that small um, 40 foot by nine and a half feet um, you know, area, you can grow far more uh, you can grow far more than you would be able to in a, a standard uh, a field of that size. What you can also do is grow year round. Obviously, many of us, if not all of us, are from Chicago. You can't really grow lettuce or basil in you know February. You can try; it's not going to work. What uh, systems like this do is remove variables like climate. They remove variables like availability of sunlight and allow us to keep growing. That produce then grown in this second phase, the outdoor storage unit systems will then be used uh, as ingredients again in our new development here, a, a food um, production uh, a facility here. These are all the two phases here, our indoor units and our outdoor units are going to serve as a pilot, like I said. It, it's for us here at the depository to learn about it, is, is to you know find out the pitfalls, is to actually have hands-on you know, knowledge of the subject for the potential future hopeful expansion of this program to other pantries in the greater Chicagoland area. I do not believe that hydroponics is ever going to usurp traditional agriculture as our um, main means of producing food here in the city, but it certainly will act as a great um, addition to it. it it'll act as a great uh, subsidy to the food already produced here. Um, being able to have year round reliable access to greens as well as other um, produce items will greatly help Chicago be able to uh, have a lot more buffer to, as we know, uh, supply chain issues. The availability of things like lettuce are going to be right here available year round in Chicago. Um, what it also does is provides areas of the city that might not have access to arable land. As we know, um, not a lot of room in Chicago when it comes to, uh, you know, the availability of growing. Um, I personally have a hard time growing in my backyard because the soil has, has just gone through years and years of, of development and remediation. Um, so it takes a bit of time to be able to remediate that soil, to you know, add compost to it, to, to be able to grow. With these closed systems, it makes it a lot easier and we are much more buffered to the effects of uh, supply chains. Furthermore, it buffers us to the effects of climate change as well. Um, as you know, summers get warmer and winters get colder, 
our ability to grow nonstop in a closed system um, will become very important here in the future of um, Chicago food. Um, right now, there are plenty of places in Chicago that are expertly working in hydroponics. Um, and I have had the chance to talk to many of them and uh, we are excited to start that program here um, at the food depository. Um, yeah, it, 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 is, it is something that is important to me personally. I've worked in hydroponics uh, now since I was in high school, originally working at a farm in Gary, Indiana. Um, and what I, I truly would, would hope for it to someday be is a way for communities, smaller communities in Chicago, to own the production of their food. If there are these large, larger storage container units that are viable to provide for community, uh, allowing communities to actually grow and plan for their next harvest is, is really an exciting prospect. So I would really love to answer a lot more about it. I could, you know, talk on the subject for hours. It's something that I'm very passionate about. But with that, um, I think we can move on to the question and answer portion of things. Yeah, we can. So it's up to how um, Sean, Nick, and Ezra, how you want to do it. There's not a Q&A feature enabled for this session for Zoom. So we can either do uh, the chat box and they can just put it posted in there and you can take questions and answer, or we can do it more, try to do it a little bit more organically with people just coming off mute. I will say that there's like 125 people in this chat, so that might get a little crazy, but uh, whatever you feel most comfortable with. Thank you. Uh, thanks. Um, yeah, I think um, just some questions in the chat box would be totally fine uh, as far as we're concerned. Um, and as people are kind of formulating their questions, I think that um, a point that I, I wanted to make sure to drive home is that uh, food sovereignty is a hyperlocal issue. When we talk about what um, what the, the the history of humanity looks like, and what the future of humanity looks like, I think there's a similarity there where you're going to be like, we need to have lo local resilient systems of food. And, you know, this is just a drop in the bucket uh, and a, a little push of the push of the bike pedals toward that. So um, let's. Can, uh, can, I, can I just yeah. also interrupt real quick? So uh, and we do have uh, Spanish interpreters. So um, for you all, can you just uh, read aloud the question that you're going to take on? And then as you answer, just be mindful of the, of the pace. Thank you. Yeah. Cool. Um, so the first question is, could nearby suburban, Skokie, et cetera, green space be used? Um, I think that the, I actually don't know what the entire footprint, I think that we cover all of Cook County uh, as an organization. Um, so that is uh, sort of the area that we would be looking to uh, work inside of. Um, there are, um and I, I believe like Skokie is, is Skokie Skokie's Cook County, right? I'm not super sure. But um yeah, we are we're, we're definitely looking to operate uh specifically in Cook County and in the city uh within like a short distance of space. Thanks everyone for answering the question. Uh like so we want yeah we want the, the farm to be very very close to the pantry um uh that we're working with. Um, the next question I'm seeing is how is this initiative being funded? So um, basically it is kind of, it is remaining in pilot phase. The initiative for uh, the hyperlocal food purchasing from, from farms, uh, it was um, put in as kind of a pilot um, with a small budget uh, from the food depository. Uh, so that is food depository dollars um, that are going into that. Um, Mick, I don't know if there's any difference in how the hydroponics are being funded. Yeah, so um, the hydroponics program is actually being funded by a private donor that had a uh, big interest in, in the uh, program itself. And then I actually think we had missed a question from uh, Gabriel at the top there. Oh, a few ahead. questions. Looks a few questions. Um, uh, so Gabriel's first question was, have you seen the program at the University of Cambridge's Growing Underground in London? Um, I have not seen that, but I'm going to take note of it and look further into that. Are we planning to use food computers or digital twin to monitor the hydroponic systems? So the 
we are still um, looking at vendors currently, but most of the vendors use a proprietary software that can be accessed through your phone and that keeps detailed records of, uh, you know, harvest and nutrient inputs. Um, so I'm not too sure if digital or food computers are their own thing, but there is going to be a proprietary software used. And then last question, how do we plan on powering the facility? Um, so it's going to be connected just into our grid here. My um, hopeful future plan is that these would be powered solar or uh, through some other uh, reusable means. Cool. Um, I'll move to the next question that I'm seeing here, uh, which is how do we go about talking to local supermarkets to donate food to food pantries? I live near Pete's Market and they usually throw food away. Uh, Mick, that's the rest of your job. <laughs> yes, <laughs> that is something you can contact me about. Um, we are always working to, you know, try and uh, mediate food waste in any way. When it comes to the more retail side of things, we like to connect um, retails actually with pantries nearby. Um, when I deal with donations, I deal with more of the large scale donations. So some oftentimes I will get a third party logistics company that is moving pallets of food from manufacturer to retailer and along the way something got damaged or the retailer can't accept, so I'll accept larger pallets. Um, oftentimes when people have smaller donations in mind, a few cases, um, a few extra cans, they will give me a call and I'm more than happy to talk them through um, ways to try and mediate waste in that way. Um, at the end here, if anyone wants to reach out to me, I can give you my email and we can talk all about ways to donate that, that are not already being followed. Great. Um, the, uh, we've got a question here that says, have you considered mutual aid shares funded by community members or GCFD sponsored CS Day farm shares specifically for pantry users? Um, I'm, and the person is thinking about pantry users becoming even closer to the local food system outside the pantry world. Um, that I think is a great question. I think that something that was kind of baked into the initial concepts here is that as people become more familiar with uh, with the farms where their food is growing, like initializing, initialized through the pantry system, that they might become um, customers or something like that uh, of those farms in some way. Um, the CSA format is something that um, was considered um, before my time, like before the, the program got started. Um, I think that the, um, in looking at the overall like logistics of how that, um, how that will work, um, we ended up doing the sort of like, you know, the uh, farm is dropping off what they have available and sending an invoice. Um, Ezra, I don't know if you have any more background on the considerations around like a possible CSA sort of format. Yeah, um, we have certainly sent a couple, if we have a couple extra CSA boxes that we've already made, we've sent a couple and there's definitely interest from pantries. I think the difficulty in setting that up has been one delivery and drop off points, um, certainly like using the pantries as a delivery point or as a drop off point is an option. I think the bigger concern is meeting a need that serves the entire pantry with CSA boxes. So if, it's, if a pantry has, you know, 100 people coming in and one farm doesn't have capacity to, to meet 100 CSA boxes weekly, um, what does that look like? How are you selecting members out of those regular regular pantry users. Um, so that has been a difficulty, I think, also um, putting together the logistics of, um, you know, if we were going to do like a combined CSA box with other farms in the program right now, or, you know, looking to add, you know, other other uh, non-perishable items and things, kind of coordinating that all together um, seemed like it was maybe a, a less direct, less effective way to just get, um, our produce directly into the hands of people who already kind of have a channel that they're used to and comfortable with. But it it's certainly something we've had some more expressed interest in and, and I've thought about a little bit here and there. Yeah. Um, so yeah, um, let's see, the next one I'm seeing is uh, from uh, Veronica. Uh, says, hello everyone. I reside in the uh, historic back of the yards neighborhood where we grow food and herbs outdoors and indoors. We also produce our own compost. 
and will soon expand our mushroom cultivation space, which is totally mm -hmm. rad. Uh, I love mushrooms. Um, are there specific food growing permits or safety certificates needed to sell to your organization? Um, so this is something that we have not uh, strictly codified. Um, I do think um, everyone that we are working with so far has some sort of HACCP plan. So a basic food safety plan that is uh, in place. Um, we do have a food safety expert on our staff um, who we have uh, been able to show those plans to, and he has been able to um, give the approval of like, you know, yes, this is this, this is enough of a, a cleaning process. Um, I, I don't want to say that we're going to require um, a super specific thing, but I also uh, want to make sure that we are, I think that food safety and making 100% sure that places are operating in a food safe manner is, it's, you know, it's the most important thing, like the food has to be safe. So um, as of now, a, a HACCP plan and a general, um, a general overview of what your food safety uh, methods are uh, allows us to decide um, if there's um, any concerns or if there's anything that needs to be changed. Um, but we are, we'll probably, honestly, we will probably end up codifying something and having some sort of specific requirement. Um, I do recommend checking out, um, going to Advocates for Urban Agriculture's website. They have a really great, really thorough um, overview of um, uh, of what's required, like what um, what what is what dollar value of uh, sales you might need, you might be at, and what your requirements around uh, the Food Safety Modernization Act uh, requirements are. So I recommend uh, Advocates for Urban Agriculture uh, for that, and uh, let me know what you're growing and what how you're cleaning it. <laughs> and uh, I'm actually going to go ahead and drop my contact information in the chat here, um, and it is. Um, I'm making sure it's spelled right. Okay, got it. Um, so I just dropped my information in the chat. So you can, um, anyone here can reach out to me. Uh, if you have a farm that you'd like to connect to the system um, and uh, talk a little more. And uh, Eliana, thank you so much for mentioning what HACCP is. I got the, I did the jargon thing. I'm so sorry. <laughs> um, Zach, uh, Ezra, did you want to say anything else about um, food safety that you all are doing or um, kind of how that got set up uh, from the outset? Yeah, um, we had been processing in our normal kind of typical way without, we had an organic certification, we've been selling at markets for a long time. Um, everyone has their food, their, their serve safe food handlers and food manager um, certifications done. Um, and so we worked through that, we had kind of a, our, our process laid out um, everything written out, just how everything was harvested, handled, who was handling it. Um, we had kind of our flow of, of our, our washroom um, and our pack out, and then a day by day check of what was in the cooler, how long it had been there, um, when it was getting sent out, everything like that. Pretty much everything we send out is the day after or two days after harvest. Um, so nothing is, is staying in our cooler very long. Um, but since then, uh, actually, since in the, the year after that we started um, this program, we're partway through, we've started, we started our GAP certification, we're about halfway through it right now, um, which is kind of, can be a bit of an undertaking. AUA has been helping a lot. We're going through group, group GAP certification. Um, but yeah, it was not, it wasn't required for us to get started on this, um, but we did have kind of some similar documents in place and documentation in place regarding how we were handling, how harvest went, um, and our, our wash protocols and, and kind of what was acceptable and not acceptable. Yeah, so I think it's safe to say that there, um, you know, depending on what documentation you have uh, for your farm, uh, there might be a little bit of back and forth to get to the point where our organization is ready to accept it. Um, but we're also here to work with folks. Um, we're not we're not trying to um, we're trying to you know reduce barriers uh, rather than uh, reinforce the status quo, which is the problem in the first place. Um, so uh, I got a question from uh, Zach, uh, which is, is there any opportunity to assist local farms or food pantries with capacity building, uh, primarily thinking of refrigerated space? Um, so this is not my strong suit as far as the um, like uh, building out refrigerated space and stuff like that. I do know that the food depository 
uh, has an enormous um, back, background of uh, supporting uh, food pantries and providing um, the support needed to have refrigeration, transportation, um, things like that. So I do know that there are systems for that. Um, I do think it's a really interesting question to talk about, about at the farm level, because as of right now, what we've been doing with our um, with our program has been to be purchasing food that's already at a place that's able to you know, produce and then properly harvest and store it. Um, as of right now, we don't have a program like that in place, but I think that that's uh, a great thing to recommend and to, um, to talk about um, in the future here. Um, Bob has the question um, of if we currently have or in the future develop relationships with local growers, will GCFD help fund purchases from them? Um, and the answer to that is for sure. I think that um, if there is a grower who can um, sort of fit into and do, you know, do the basic stuff that I've gone over, which is, you know, pretty consistent orders, decent sized orders, um, or even, you know, there's, there's some, there could be some benefit to um, like a, a larger one, one time purchase, like we uh, purchased honey uh, from Southside Blooms. Uh, we did, you know, big, two big purchases of it. And that, that's what we did for the year with them. Um, it's a great organization. Um, so, um, yeah, I, I can definitely foresee that. And so, you know, if you're working on something, uh, please reach out. Um, and then Eleanor was curious, uh, have, have you guys talked to Chicago Botanic Garden uh, or the plant? And uh, they know that in their experience uh, in hydroponics, um, Eleanor was asking because uh, they were in an after school matters program uh, connected with Chicago Botanical Garden, uh, which is where they learned about it. Um, Mick, have you talked to them? Talked yeah, to so yeah, I talked to a lot of people. I actually just got back to Eleanor in a DM, but uh, during the kind of informational finding portion of this, you know, coming on eight to eight to 10 months ago, I, I had reached out to all, everyone I could possibly find in the hydroponic space to just, you know, gather information and see how we could be, you know, best fit into the space. So yes, I have reached out to them, but um, there's certainly room for me to, to reconnect with many players in this field going forward. Yeah, the uh, the feeling of need to reconnect with more people in this field going forward is, is very present in my mind as well. Um, yes. I'm really hoping that um, through this conference and, and just kind of ongoing conversations, we can um, build out this program um, and add a couple of more farms this year. Uh, I know there's a lot of people growing a lot of great food in the city, so uh, we we'd absolutely want to get tapped into that. Um, I want to leave space for any other um, any other questions that folks have. Uh, sweet, one popped in. Thanks, Eliana. Um, you mentioned early earlier uh, your numbers on how much you have invested to date and intention to do more. What is more looking like? Is that further funding, or is it just related to the hydroponic pilot program? Um, I so as far as the uh, the farm purchasing uh, program goes, I I don't have a good sense of like what the overall plan is. We do intend I we do intend to continue it and to um, increase the the dollar amount. Um, hope you know going forward, hopefully. Um, but that's not been uh, locked in yet. We're the the current um, budget kind of covers us through um, the end of the fiscal year, which is end of June, and then um, going into you know starting with uh, July, uh, the July fiscal year, because we do that sort of half half a year fiscal year thing, um, or mid year. Um, that that is up in the air, um, but all the indications that I've seen have been um, that it, that it should grow. Um, the yeah, I I always I always say I think this should be a huge deal and uh, and everything, but um, it also um, comes down to you know capacity, timing, uh, making sure that it it can work inside of our work days. So that is a very good and very uh, uh, proper question to ask here. Um, Mick, did you have any answers on like how uh, the future of the um, hydroponic uh system is, is looking uh, i know it's like a big expense up front so yes um so as i had mentioned the hydroponics pilot program is just that a pilot program it is to seek information and find out more about the systems themselves um 
also furthermore, the, the program hasn't started yet. Come next month, we will actually begin growing. Um, so the ideas of expansion and, you know, continuing this on a broader scale here in Chicago is really reliant on the data and information we gather in the next two or three years here on our on our uh, campus. Mm -hmm. um, Maggie has the question of, would there be a way to repurpose abandoned buildings and make them into indoor growing centers? And um, I think the short answer to that is, um, the, that the I think there's all there's probably a lot of like you know food safety remains one of the top concerns so retrofitting an abandoned building to make sure that it's safe uh, for for food production I think is uh, maybe a top concern uh, it might have some substantial expense versus just you know getting a lease and um, uh, or, or or making a, a building purchase of a uh, building that isn't already abandoned I think that's really interesting though I think that that um, can be um, uh, that can that could definitely be like uh, a direction that folks could go. Um, Eliana mentions that um, the power sourcing um, and and whether to do grid uh, power or uh, renewables is definitely a consideration. Um, so yeah, that's totally right. Um, I feel like we're wrapping up and winding down here. Uh, we were gonna close at 3.15 or so, um, but I guess I wanted to provide a little space for some sort of closing thoughts from Mick or Ezra, and also if some questions pop in in the next couple of minutes, we'll obviously uh, get to those. Yeah, I can provide a, a few closing thoughts um, on hydroponics is what I'm gonna be speaking on. Um, like I had mentioned, I don't foresee a future where everything that we eat that has been grown is grown inside of a closed system box with lights and, and nutrients added. I believe it's a way to supplement um, the food already grown here. It's a, it's a um, you know, quote unquote, easy way to add more local foods to the Chicagoland area. I, I don't want it to be viewed as a crush, but rather an additional um, area that we could source food from. Um, it's something I'm very excited about. And like I said, and I put in the chat, if anyone has questions or thoughts about hydroponics um, or donations for that matter, please feel free to reach out to me and I can give my thoughts. Yeah, thanks, Sean. Thanks, um, I think, yeah, the greatest thing is we're looking to continue to grow this partnership that we have right now. Um, it's It's been really great to have that consistency, like I said, and. Um, you know, I think it's been an amazing way to kind of use infrastructure that's already built there, right? There's been kind of these pathways uh, for a long time uh, of getting food directly into the hands of people who need it. And we're a farm that's been here for some time now, for 15 years or so, that's looking to still grow. Um, and with that comes kind of a need to look for new infrastructure and hopefully not have to remake work over and over again. So, you know, I hope there's more opportunity for more partnerships into this program as well, because I know, you know, farms are growing great food and many farmers are not hoping to, you know, introduce more, more work to find, find people to eat that food when they know that those, those people are out there already. So, um, yeah, it's been a really great time to, to have that connection and to work for the past couple of years so far with Sean. Yeah. Awesome. Um, well, I want to thank uh, SIFPAC and I uh, super want to thank everybody that showed up to this talk. And um, I feel like this was such a uh, kind of nuts and bolts conversation. I think there's a lot of like sort of background uh, theories and, and concepts and, and ideas and dreaming that is happening at this conference that I really encourage all of uh, my colleagues at the Food Depository that are on this call to, to also join those calls or call, uh, join those conversations. Um, also, very much looking forward to seeing many of you on Friday. Um, I'll be there. Um, I have to say vote in the mayoral election. Uh, I can't uh, end the call without giving that shout out. Um, so yeah, uh, really appreciate everyone's time and everyone's uh, uh, thoughts and attention on this. Yeah, thank you, Sean. Thank you, Mick, Ezra.